And um, with that, I'll hand over to Peter and his talk. Great. Um, yep. First, just before uh, I begin, uh, I would like to say a huge thank you to everyone involved here, especially Pedro for uh, suggesting and spearheading this uh, topic, this great uh, special issue. Uh, Ole for all of your hard work. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you as well to my fellow presenters and a huge thank you uh, in advance to the uh, interpreters who are doing great work. Uh, and if I'm talking too quickly, please tell me to slow down. No problem. So uh, I'm going to give a talk about my paper, which is an exploration on the appeal of the Cosmic Horror series of game books for the Call of Cthulhu uh, TRPG. So, uh, oh, do I have control of this? I do. Great. Uh, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Peter or Paddy Kleins. Uh, originally, I'm from Ireland, but I have been living and working in Japan for about eight or nine years now. Um, uh, at my current job, we have a weekly uh, English board game session, which has been going great. And just last week, we confirmed from the fourth quarter, we'll now have weekly role playing games with the students to prepare them for studying abroad, which I'm very excited about. Um, oh, well, that's, that was what it was. Uh, I have an MA in Applied Linguistics and TESOL, and my focus is mostly on board games and TRPGs in education, uh, but also with conversation analysis separate to games. Um, I also have a YouTube channel on TRPGs called RPGs with Paddy. If you're interested, check it out. It's terrible. Um, so a little bit about this. Um, my main question was, why do people play this series of game books for um, Call of Cthulhu? I wanted to uh, look at the theory um, and then get real responses to see, you know, what people were actually saying. So uh, very briefly, just look at uh, the history of game books. Actually, it dates back all the way to 1930. Consider the Consequences um, is a game where you chose uh, what people did in kind of a, there were multiple romances and if uh, families approved of it and stuff like that. Uh, you can actually play this online digitally now. Uh, the physical copy is a little bit hard to get. But of course, the big boom came in the 1970s and 1980s with uh, Choose Your Own Adventure, A Lone Wolf and um, all of those series. But the main thing is that fantasy really dominated the game book uh, industry uh, with huge uh, series like this predominantly being fantasy. Of course, there were exceptions uh, like some sci-fi entries and some horror entries. Um, and most notably, uh, the series Goosebumps, uh, children's uh, horror stories, Goosebumps had a series of game books as well called Give Yourself Goosebumps, which I loved reading. Uh, but the main thing is um, fantasy really dominated uh, this. Horror was not so common. And uh, going back to way, way back to Aristotle, uh, first posited the idea of the paradox of tragedy in that uh, in real life, we try to avoid uh, feelings like sadness, um, uh, uh, because these are, you know, inherently negative feelings that we want to avoid most of the time. But when it comes to literature, um, we like to seek that out. We we love tragedy. Uh, and this has been extended then to horror, where, you know, horror and repulsion are things we try to avoid in real life as much as possible. But uh, horror books, horror uh, movies are really popular. And so that's why, why do we do that? Um, a little bit about cosmic horror, uh, which is a subgenre of horror. Um, it's mostly uh, attributed to H.P. Lovecraft. And the core concepts are a fear of the unknown, uh, kind of the need for knowledge and answers. Um, so even though we know something might be risky, we we need to just push that a little bit more to find out more. And that ties in very well with game books, because very often in game books, we take a, an option, not because we would take it in real life, but because we need to find out what's behind that door. <laughs> Excuse me, even if it's dangerous. And so it really ties in well with cosmic horror. And another core concept I have to mention is just the insignificance of humanity in the cosmic sphere. 
Um, for cosmic horror, there is usually a solo protagonist or this feeling of isolation. Uh, the Call of Cthulhu features a solo protagonist traveling around the world trying to solve a mystery. At the Mountains of Madness features two main characters, but they're very isolated down in Antarctica. Um, so as we know, solo horror uh, is more horrific than experiencing it in a group. When we experience horror in groups, our threat perception goes down, our stress responses go down, our risk taking goes up. And for example, when we're watching movies uh, in groups, our fear goes down. So in game books, we are choosing to experience this on our own, uh, which will intensify the horror. So we're choosing to make this more horrific if we choose the game book version of Call of Cthulhu rather than the um, uh, the multi-person uh, tabletop role-playing game. Uh, so the tabletop role-playing game uh, was originally created by Sandy Peterson back in 1981. It's gone through six editions. It's currently in its seventh edition now. And players take on the role of investigators, regardless of their occupation, where they try to uncover some kind of mystery. Um, so for the game book series for Call of Cthulhu, it started in 1985 with the release of Alone Against the Dark. It was followed in the same year with Alone Against the Wendigo. And it wasn't until 2015 that the next one came out, Alone Against the Flames. Now, this tied in with the release of the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu, uh, which was a big change of the rules. Uh, second edition to sixth edition was fairly minor changes, but the seventh edition had a lot of new uh, rule changes. So Chaosium, the producers, decided to bring out this game book to teach uh, people how to play the new seventh edition. This was for players new to the game, but also players of previous editions to show them how the new changes took place. Um, after that, uh, Chaosium uh, renewed uh, Alone Against the Dark and released it in 2017. And Alone Against the Wendigo was updated, uh, but the name was changed to Alone Against the Frost to avoid any cultural sensitivity issues in uh, in Canada. Um, and finally, the last game, Alone Against the Tide, was released in... Uh, I can't see it because my screen is in the way. I think it was 2020 it was. Good, good, good. Um, so another factor is that um, people might choose to play a game book because they have difficulty in finding a group. When we look at Call of Cthulhu, many rankings show that it's a popular game, but it's still relatively niche within the RPG community, and the RPG community is itself a rather a niche, uh, a niche uh, community. And we often see these reports saying that Dungeons & Dragons, the largest of the RPGs, people are having a lot of trouble finding game masters, finding groups, often saying this is the most difficult part about um, role-playing games. And if this is happening for Dungeons & Dragons, the largest game, then it's very likely that it's happening possibly to a bigger scale for smaller games like uh, Call of Cthulhu. So after all of that background information, uh, I had these suggested reasons why I thought people might be choosing to play these games. They were to learn the rules of the game, uh, mostly from Alone Against the Flames, uh, to make the horror more intense and intimate because they're playing it by themselves and they're responsible for the choices uh, because they have difficulty getting a group together or possibly to replicate that solo protagonist nature of cosmic horror. I added in two other reasons that just seemed plausible to me. Uh, people might just prefer solo games, and they might just find the story intriguing. Um, respondents to the survey were also given an other option where they could freely write in. Um, so just very quickly, we'll look at the responses. Um, the ages, uh, there, there was quite a wide variety of uh, respondents here, the largest group being the 50 to 59, but I think most age groups were represented relatively well in this. Um, one of the questions that I asked was, what is your experience with both playing Call of Cthulhu, the tabletop role-playing game, but also what is your experience with keeping 
uh, keeping uh, in Call of Cthulhu, the game master is called the Keeper of Arcane Lore, or Keeper for short. So what is your experience playing the game? And what is your experience game mastering the game? And we can see here, uh, playing is in blue, keeping is in, or game mastering is in orange. And actually, there's a fairly even split between the two across each uh, level of experience. But we can see that there was a, uh, the largest group is the people who have been playing or game mastering for over 21 years. And so this suggests that uh, people who started the game back when it began, back in the 1980s, um, seem to love it. And a lot of them have stuck with it for a long period of time. But it seems that the six to 20 year period here uh, didn't pick up or didn't retain as many people as well. And we see more recently in the past five years, it seems like there's an uptake. This could be due to the general increase in popularity in uh, RPGs uh, over the past five to 10 years, or it could be the re release of the seventh edition of Call of Cthulhu uh, back in 2014, which has been uh, particularly popular. Uh, but the, this this study isn't sufficient to, to say why that happened. Um, so I asked people, among the four um, game books for Call of Cthulhu, how often have you played it? And the largest, most striking number here you can see is the blue uh, category, which is zero playthroughs. So actually, the vast majority of the responses had never played Alone Against the Dark, Alone Against the Tide, or Alone Against the Frost. But uh, Alone Against the Flames had been played the most. Um, it's not particularly surprising because this game is included in the Call of Cthulhu starter set. So a lot of people will go through it from that. And it's also available as a free PDF download from the Chaosium website. So a lot of people would have played that. But an interesting thing is Alone Against the Tide was only released in uh, 2020. But it has pretty similar numbers to both Alone Against the Dark and Alone Against the Frost, which were released in 1985 and then re-released again in uh, 2017 and 2018. Uh, so that suggests that possibly when the game books were first released in 1985, they weren't really that popular. Uh, but the newer releases um, seem to be, you know, equally as popular as the older releases. So it's possible that um, despite the heyday of game books being in the 1980s, that it's possible that this is finding a really niche audience among the RPG community. Uh, so the core question of this study was to find out why are you playing these games? And uh, just briefly, we'll go through them all. For Alone Against the Flames, the most popular reasons were to learn the rules. They found the story intriguing and they had difficulty finding a group to play with. Um, for Alone Against the Frost, it was the story was intriguing and difficulty finding a group. For Alone Against the Tide, it was actually uh, quite varied. But the number one reason was difficulty finding a group. And finally, for Alone Against the Dark, again, we see the same reasons coming up. A difficulty finding group, they found the story intriguing. And interestingly, uh, to learn the rules, Alone Against the Dark is the only one of these four games to introduce new additional rules that are only used in that game book that aren't used in the core game of um, Call of Cthulhu. So actually, that seems like a bad book to learn the rules from, but it seems like uh, people were using it. Um, I also asked people to rank the game or to rate the game on a scale of one to five. How much did you enjoy it? And actually, all the games were very, very similarly ranked. Uh, the lowest being uh, Alone Against the Dark at 3.44 and the highest being uh, Alone Against the Flames at 3.75. So they're all fairly uh, similarly popular. Uh, now, going into the mathematics, I have a mathematical background, so uh, sorry about that. Um, but I just wanted to see, was there any correlation, any connection between uh, people's reasons for playing the game and either their age or their experience playing or their experience keeping? And so that's what these numbers uh, mean here. Um, for correlation, we're looking at a minus one, a negative one means that there's perfect inverse correlation, which means as you get older, for example, you're less likely to choose this option. 
Whereas a positive one plus one would mean perfect correlation, which means as you get older, you're more likely to choose this option. Um, so looking at Alone Against the Flames, uh, we can see something very interesting, uh, well, two very interesting things. Um, we have almost perfect uh, inverse correlation for age and learning the rules. This means that the older you got, you are much less likely to learn the rules from this game. Um, so that might be older people are more experienced with the game. They don't uh, want to use it. Um, but uh, it was interesting to see that that uh, held, that correlation held as well with people with a lot of uh, playing experience and with a lot of keeping experience. But one of the key findings uh, I found is the difficulty finding a group had almost perfect correlation uh, with age. So that means that older people are really having a lot more difficulty finding groups to play with. And that's why they're choosing to play these solo games. And um, we can see that that also holds um, for people with a lot of playing experience. So actually, it, the study shows that um, for, for these uh, respondents anyway, the more experience you had playing, the more likely it was that you had trouble finding a group, which seems a little bit strange. But very interestingly, the final number in that column uh, showed that there was no correlation with difficulty finding a group and your keeper experience. So people who have maybe been playing the game for longer or have been or, or are a little bit older, if they have been a game master, then um, they usually don't have as much trouble finding a group. So that's a lesson for us all. We should all become game masters. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, oh, well, I forgot I highlighted everything. Sorry. Um, Grant, we'll flick, flick on to Alone Against the Frost. Um, there were fewer responses for this, so uh, less statistical analysis. Um, but we can see that older people were less likely to find this story intriguing, uh, which is interesting. Uh, but again, we see that uh, age factor older people are much less likely are much more likely to have trouble finding a group um for alone against the tide very few answers for this and very little uh, of consequence here only that having more keeping experience maybe made it more likely that you had difficulty finding a group and finally for alone against the dark uh, people were more likely to learn the rules from this if they were older so younger people are learning the rules from Alone Against the Flames, but older people are learning the rules from Alone Against the Dark, possibly because they remember it uh, when it was released in 1985, uh, but I couldn't say. Anyway, uh, if you uh, passed out for all that mathematics, uh, we'll just get to the summary anyway. Um, the main reasons that people were um, people chose to play these games were they had difficulty finding a group, uh, they were using it to learn the rules uh, or they found the story intriguing. Uh, the uncommon reasons, even though the theory might suggest it, is people didn't really want to use it to create that more intimate horror. Uh, they didn't care about cosmic horror often having a solo protagonist. And very few people said that they just prefer playing solo games. Um, just keep in mind that these are relatively small response numbers. There were a total of 116 acceptable responses to the survey. So these uh, findings are more indicative rather than binding. Uh, but this does lead to some interesting future research uh, 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 problems, questions. Um, one is, are game books a good way to learn RPG systems? Because uh, any of you who play RPGs know that one of the biggest hurdles is learning the rules. And not only for you as a game master to learn the rules, but for your players to learn the rules. And if game books are a simple, enjoyable uh, way to learn the at least the basics of the system, then that could be really uh, well applied to almost every uh, RPG out there. The second thing is, how can we find players, but particularly older players, how can we help them find groups? Because we see older players having difficulty finding groups, and therefore they're turning to game books. I love that they're playing game books, but 
uh, if they want to play in groups, maybe uh, we, we need to research that a little bit more. And uh, finally, uh, is there a market for more RPG game books? Because the people who played them seem to play them a few times, seem to enjoy them. Um, and Chaosium themselves, the creators of Call of Cthulhu, have said that they plan to extend the range as well. But it's less popular in other RPGs. Um, and finally, just as I mentioned for Alone Against the Flames, uh, even though older people and people with more experience had more difficulty finding a group, people who were game masters didn't seem to have that trouble. So possibly being a game master is a good way to ensure that you always have a group to play with. Um, what? I can't remember. Yes. Uh, so in summary, uh, there's a small but growing selection of horror game books, uh, especially for RPGs. Uh, people do see them as a good way to learn the rules. And they do, to a certain extent, address a problem of having difficulty finding gaming groups. Uh, just last, two slightly unrelated slides. Um, Chaosium do have, or Call of Cthulhu does have some other uh, game books which were outside the scope of this. Uh, Grimrock Isle uh, is from a different publisher back in 1986, I think. Uh, Alone and Alone and in Danger Again. Alone uh, on Halloween is out of print. is very difficult to get, but I spoke to the author and he is. Uh, he is publishing a new version of it very soon. Alone Against the Stat Static is a new uh, game produced by Chaosium, and it was due to be released in October, but it's been pushed back to December. And in uh, private communication with um, uh, Mike Mason, head of Call of Cthulhu, he said that they are also working on game books for Pulp Cthulhu and Down Darker Trails, which are two sub-genres of um, Call of Cthulhu. And finally, just on the point of learning the rules, Chaosium, uh, the producers of Call of Cthulhu, uh, they use it in Call of Cthulhu through Alone Against the Flames, but they also use game books to teach the rules to the other RPGs in their system. So in RuneQuest, they have this solo quest to teach the rules of it. In the new, newly released Pendragon 6th edition, they also have a game book to teach you the rules of that game. And in their uh, RPG based on the uh, fiction series Rivers of London, again, they are using a game book within the rule book to teach you the basic rules. So you can learn the rules without reading the rule books by just playing a game. And that is everything. Sorry for going over time, I'm sure. Uh, but thank you. If you have any questions, I would love to hear them. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, yeah, questions and comments. Um, I think we already had some thing popping up in the in the Discord talk of of Kondal Sun's um, uh, discussion uh, about replays and um, a way of people learning to play role playing games in in Japan. And um, as most people will know, um, Call of Cthulhu is one of the most popular tabletop role playing games currently in in Japan. Yes. So I hope to hear some some voices from Japan on this. But first, Marco, please. Hi. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, and, uh, you know, Dungeons and Dragons came out in 1974. In 1975, Gary Gygax wrote an article saying people cannot find groups and they're asking for a solitaire option. 1975. So that's a long problem. I don't know that we're going to solve it. But what they experimented for a while was actually to teach the game through game books. So some early Dungeons and Dragons sets had a mini adventure and board games. So they have board games that were simplified versions, but they were considered to be introductory to the role-playing game, not alternatives. So maybe another way is it doesn't have to be either or. The board game can be another option, and many board games of Dungeons and Dragons have been designed that way. The character you created for the board game, then you could actually bring to the full role-playing game, for example. So uh, that's uh, that's uh, some some responses that I had about about that. So um, uh, another thing, so finding the group there was something else I want to say. Now I'm getting uh, confused myself. Uh, yes, about cosmic horror. Mm -hmm. One 
possible paradox is when you're alone, um, when you're alone, there is a sense of dread, of course. But if you're alone, there are only two possible states, dead or alive. And if I'm and if I'm dead, the story is not continuing. Once the horror happens, the story shut down. Which is why, say in slasher movies, you have a group of characters that is thinned down because so you have a mix between the horror that's happening and the fear of more horror. Mm -hmm. So that's possibly a paradox, I believe, with solo horror, mm -hmm. solo horror adventures. Have you thought about that? About the, the, there's possibly a fundamental problem there with the solo interactive adventure that can only scare me up to a certain point because once it, the bad things happen, the game is over. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, especially the comment from uh, Gary Gygax. I wasn't aware that he said uh, we need more game masters as, as early as that. Um, and I I have actually played some of the board games as introductions uh, to uh, Dungeons and Dragons as well. Um, uh, when it comes to the cosmic horror game books, one of the things that I think actually ties in cosmic horror with um with game books very well is um that really growing creeping horror. And the fact that when you're reading one of the uh, stories in Cosmic Horror, it is a growing, creeping horror. But in game books, it's even more intense, in my opinion, because it's so self-inflicted. You could easily, a lot of these game books do have options for kind of um, uh, going towards more of a safe option and, you know, not, not being as satisfying. But it's our own desire to 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 unravel that mystery and we're like i know this is going to be bad for me but i need to find out and so um it helps because if you uh, for example if it was early in the game in the game book and they suggest do you want to go up to this horrible monster or something like that uh probably most people would say no um, but uh, by gradually building on that horror, you're you're kind of uh, leading people along, dragging them along to just ever so carefully building up that horror. Um, and it's not necessarily just that final threat. That is the the final realization and the culmination of of what's been built up. But the horror has been present all throughout. It's it's really good. Um, yeah. I was just about to give a spoiler for one of the games, and I won't. Uh, just everyone should play them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, Alcidia. Yes. Hi again. Thank you for your very in interesting presentation. And as, as, as far as it concerns, uh, our game, our game books a good way to learn RPG system. I remember Jan Livingstone saying uh, that uh, uh, people started like um, publisher, uh, they wanted to make people play RPGs. And in order to do so, they asked uh, the um, RPG designers and creators to write uh, um, uh, game books that could explain to people how to play these uh, mm -hmm. these RPGs by playing, of course. So this, uh, I if I recall correctly, this this was like the start, the, the beginning, the birth of game books. And um, uh, for the other for um, the other point, how to help uh, uh, adult uh, people to find a group. Uh, I noticed that now, nowadays, I think it, it, this might be related to COVID in some in some way. Uh, that there are uh, like um, uh, um, new um, new RPGs which uh, permit people to play it in a in a solo version. Like this is one of mm. the latest I found, and uh, I think this is connected to COVID. And while discussing with other people, other 
other gamers uh, in games fair i uh, they they were of this this uh, same opinion so probably now like, like the you said that uh, no sorry Arnaldo said that Gygax uh, um, um, uh, he said that back in in their times there was this same problem now maybe we have the same problem but the reason might be different so mm. this would this was that's great yeah thank you very much uh, I hadn't known about uh, John Livingston um uh, you know recruiting RPG designers to to create uh, game books um and Yes, the solo games are fantastic. I think that both game books and solo RPGs um are a great way to kind of deal with that um uh with that inability to find groups. Um I do think it is still something that's very worth uh exploring more much more than than uh I did as well is how can we overcome that difficulty as people get older? They have trouble finding groups because a lot of the respondents did say, I wish I had a group to play and then, you know, maybe I wouldn't play the game book, but I can't find those groups. So this is kind of like my last resort. I think the game books are actually fantastic. And I love um, from time to time playing those solo RPGs. Uh, I don't I, I don't know the one you showed, so I'll have to look it up. But um, I do think, yes, yeah, definitely. Um, some more research could be done into how we can avoid that kind of fall off as people get older, uh, because it is a great social game. And as we've seen through like the COVID pandemic, we really need that social interaction um, is very important. And RPGs can really provide that as well.